morning. Welcome to Standish Congregational Church, whether you're in person in the sanctuary or joining us on Zoom or watching the recording afterwards. We are an open and affirming congregation. Everyone is welcome, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your, on your life journey. Um, so today, our service will be led by Dave, Dave Heath one of our deacons. I, I will mention there was a little confusion. At one point, we thought we had a guest uh, pastor and um, we had to change things around a little. So th there may be a few modifications to the order of service. Please bear with us on that. And thanks to everyone who scrambled around at the last minute, Katie, Sid, Dave, um, Mary Lou, just at our, our key word is flexibility, so <laughs> thanks to everyone for uh, you know, rolling with the punches. So, so if you would now please join in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. God does not define us by what we have done in the past. We gather today to worship him who is called the light of life. In him we offer praise and thanksgiving. May he guide us into the future to do his will. The hymn of praise is Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Number twenty nine in the in the hymnal. Thank you. 
time for announcements, what's going on in the church. Um, I'll mention the next two Sundays, we will have um, Reverend Sally Colgrove back in the pulpit for Palm Sunday and Easter, Easter Sunday. Um, I encourage everyone to look at the announcements that were printed, that were handed out with the order of service. Um, I'll mention a couple things. One is the, the yard sale coming up um, this Saturday, set up on Friday, Saturday. So please look at the details there. If you have any questions, check with Mary Lou, but um, it's an important event, so please check that out. Um, oh, yes. Okay, and there's also a couple um, options for donations. There's the One Great Hour of Sharing, which is a UCC um, ministry program. So um, donate to that. Also, the is it the woman's there's a blanket Sunday. I don't know if that's the woman's woman's fellowship. I guess is doing that. So an opportunity to donate to give a church world service blanket in memory of, of a loved one. And uh, yeah, other stuff um, here. Check it out. Are there any announcements from the congregation? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, Kate. Um, I have a concern. Um, I am uh, scheduled not to be here next week, and I for a work trip, and I haven't been able to find cover because it is on Sunday, and um, a lot of people are already celebrating on that plan. Um, that being said, I'm kind of waiting until, and also reaching out to Sally saying, this is my situation. Um, if anyone has a special piece that they would like to play, um, to fill in the void, we can do that. Um, if anyone feels comfortable playing a hymn, um, you can always peek at the Palm Sunday section of the hymnal and see if that's something that you feel comfortable doing. Um, just reach out to me and let me know, um, and we'll come up with something that you do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any, any other okay. Yes, Dave. I just wanted to mention we are working on a Monday Thursday service, um, so be looking out for details on that. Um, in the past, we've done a traditional Sunday service of readings, um, and I've sent to Sally a plan that we've done in the past, so let's Make sure that uh, those details get out to you as soon as possible. It'll be Thursday the 14th. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we now return to worship. And I guess the next thing will be a message for all ages. Welcome, Mary Lou Tracy. So we, I want us to both be on the screen so you can see our shirts. Um, so what could this mean? Are we in a club of overweight people from Connecticut? <laughs> Maybe. Um, but we're big fans of the University of Connecticut. And when it's written like this, it's pronounced Yukon, which is a homonym for Y-U-K-O-N hence the Huskies um, mascot. So big game today, we're all excited. You may sit down. Uh, <laughs> so, ML is always kind of worried about the children's message, but it's not. Yeah. 
So this shows that we're fans of the University of Connecticut, but what shows that we are Christians? Do we have sweatshirts, special sweatshirts to hand, uh, wear? Do you have a hat that you put on that says, I'm a Christian, an armband or anything? Um, some people do, I guess. But for us, sitting right here, how do we show we're Christians? And there's a song that encapsulates it. Uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. So if we show love for one another, for our friends and even those people that we don't know, it's just as good as wearing a sweatshirt or a hat. People will know you're Christians. And I think that's um, the end of my not so deep thought. <laughs> oh, your actions, your actions, be Christians, your love. Oh, so let us pray. Thank you, God, for loving me. Help us to show everyone that we are Christians. Thank you, God, for loving everyone. Amen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, Eric, let me know if I'm echoing, if we need to mute the other computer or not. All set? Okay, good. So please join me in the prayer of invocation, which will be followed by the Lord's Prayer. And also you may notice that the Gloria Patri is inserted here. I've asked Katie to play that instrumentally. You can sing it along if you like. It's number 36 in the hymnal, uh, but we've kind of thrown a few curveballs at you, so I won't blame you if you don't choose to sing it. Um, but let us pray. Loving God, you know our hearts and you know our names. All our being comes from you, and one day all of us will completely return to you. We seek to live each day with joy as we reach out to share your love with one another. In this time of worship, help us to trust and believe that you are with us always. Guide us to grow with confidence and faith that as we hope to build a good life in your spirit, we will find such life in his name, through whom we now pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Thank you. And just so Katie doesn't get bored, let's have an anthem. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Kathy, Bill, John, and Katie. That was lovely, and, uh, absolutely appropriate. As we, during this Lenten season, we move toward the cross and ultimately the empty tomb. Spoiler alert. Um, the scripture this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, and uh, it describes the story of Judas's objections to the use of expensive perfume and oil. Um, Judas was not open to the new. Uh, and that's the theme of, of our service today. The, my title of my meditation is going to be A New Thing. Um, but Judas was not open to the new, and, and Jesus alone knew what was coming and why. Um, so Judas's first betrayal was 
The reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. So ends the reading. Thank you, Greg. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every year I make a grand plan to start one of those read the Bible in a year uh, plans, uh, or more realistically, keep up with the one I started the previous year. Um, one of the uh, important values for me in, in those overviews is you get a strong sense of the overarching narrative of the whole biblical story. And uh, the plan I'm currently in, on month 16, don't judge, um, it describes that narrative as God making and keeping promises. Many of these promises are kind of front loaded in the book of Genesis, starting with God's promise to Eve that her seed would crush the head of the serpent. It's kind of the first hint at the good news of Jesus Christ. God promises Noah that he'll never again destroy his creation with a flood. He promised to Abraham that his offspring would become a great people and outnumber the stars. God promised to deliver the Hebrew people from exile in Egypt and later in Babylon. And in the first century AD, the people were expecting to be delivered yet again <clears throat> from Roman oppressors. They were not expecting the delivery that God offers. God promises a new thing. They should have been expecting something different. The prophet Isaiah, writing in the 8th century BC, said, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches where I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The, the law was given to the Hebrew people as a way to differentiate themselves from, as a people of the one true God, in stark contrast to the polytheistic communities that were surrounding them. In fact, it was the context of Israel's proclivity for these local false gods, in spite of their frequent slide back into idolatry that Isaiah makes his prophecy. See, I am doing a new thing. So the people of God should have been ready for something new. A hundred years after Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. God promises a new thing. In another scripture that appears in the lectionary for today, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, he outlines his credentials as being a Hebrew among Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But when Paul was commissioned as an apostle through his encounter with the risen Christ, he opened himself up to a new thing. He took upon himself a calling to take the good news outside the realm of the Jewish community and share it with the nations. In Paul's time, even the Christian communities were having trouble embracing the new, grudgingly accepting Gentile believers into the fold. That nevertheless, they forced on them the old traditions, such as circumcision, and they kept the non-Jewish believers at arm's length. In many of his letters, Paul keys in on this return to tradition and rejects it, saying that the message of good news means that such traditions are no longer necessary for identifying the people of God, that the covenant identifier is stamped upon their hearts. Just like Mary Lou said in the children's message, they'll know we're Christians by our love. God promises a new thing. That's what the gospel is, isn't it? Good news, a new thing. The news that we don't have to be weighed down by our shortcomings. We all miss the mark. But through a restored relationship with God, he offers us renewal every day. God makes in us a new creation once our connection to God is restored through Jesus. By the Spirit, God does a new thing in our hearts. Rather than dwell on the old, and this is not to dismiss the Old Testament law, but for us who are in Jesus, we strive to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, kindness, faith, gentleness. By boiling down the old law into its most basic expressions. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And we've all kind of had the new thrust upon us in many different ways over the past couple of years, and it's kind of forced us to confront our resiliency. And I suggest that it has brought out our compassion, our empathy, our sense of community as everyone has had to adapt in some way. Of course, it's not so new now as it was two years ago today, but I've seen evidence that the Spirit of God is indeed producing fruit from the seeds of the pandemic. Not everywhere, certainly. But another piece of good news is that fruit begets fruit. So keep being kind and compassionate. Those seeds will not go to waste. And yet one more lectionary scripture for today. Psalm 126 proclaims, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. We're now deep into the Lenten season, but soon, next Sunday in fact, uh, we will begin the celebration, laying palm branches before the arriving king, in anticipation of the ultimate new thing, the empty tomb, the risen Christ, the victory over sin and death. But as we approach Easter, I hope you'll be looking within at your own hearts and see where God has initiated renewal in your own life. Think of a time when you embraced a new thing and what difference it has made to you. And try to identify what new thing God has planted in you that will bear fruit in the year ahead. Grace, number 401 in your hymn.
Amen. Now it is time to express the joys and concerns of our heart. Does anyone have anything that they would like to bring up this morning? Yeah? see if I can make this work. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Sue, can you unmute? Good morning. Good morning. Um, our grandson is having a bit of a mental health crisis. He's currently in the emergency room at Penn Bay awaiting a hospital bed in either Acadia or um, Spring Harbor. Um, so I hope, you know, I'm praying that they can help tease out what the issue is and can offer him some help. He's only nine. Thank you. Hmm? What, uh... Anyone else online? Only a few folks joining us online this morning. So. Kim, yes. Special prayers for Wendy Kent's sister in Vermont. She's in her 60s. She has COVID. She has other complications. Wendy is not able to her. She's in isolation in the hospital. She needs all the prayers we can do. Else? Well, offer up a pastoral prayer to the best of my ability, but um, keep in mind that the, uh, the uttering of a prayer is in itself a form of prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Thank you for this community of faithful, these wonderful people who have rolled with the changes and uh, displayed their true flexibility. And I offer um, sincere thanks to those who helped make it happen. Uh, we thank you for uh, the 
warming weather and the uh, spring blooms and the birds and as nature reawakens as we crawl closer to spring. We lift up to you the concerns of our heart as those uh, whom we love are suffering or struggling. Um, we offer thanks that Evelyn Shepherd, her family is doing better, having dealt with surgery and COVID and chemo. Uh, just ask that you continue to keep that family in your loving care. Um, we offer uh, prayers for Sue's grandson struggling with mental health issues. Um, pray that he would find a, a place to, to get the care that he needs and um, surround his family and loved ones with, with a sense of your presence. We pray for Wendy's sister um, dealing with COVID and in isolation. And, uh, we ask for your healing comfort around her and, uh, and Wendy's family as well. We pray for all those struggling with COVID and its repercussions, uh, whether directly affected or indirectly affected over these past two years. Um, it's been so hard and we just ask that you continue to make us, restore us to health and normalcy, whatever that means. Just um, ask that you be with all those who are affected and those in Ukraine, um, struggling in the in the war just ask that you uh, rain your peace down on those those areas affected we offer praise for will's great niece setting herself up to adopt a refugee um, just pray that more people would make that an option and and uh, have the ability and flexibility to do that so we just pray for everyone affected by that situation we ask for you to just Bring peace to all nations, Lord, and help us as we struggle through. And help us to find ways to help where we can. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now, uh, speaking of flexibility, we've been pretty flexible in our uh, means of offering um, in the, over the past few years, couple years, and uh, we ask you to continue to find ways to contribute, uh, whether mailing in your donations or offering of time and talent. Um, but uh, let's hear Katie play the offertory.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Lord of all life, receive these gifts from the wealth of our lives as we place them now before you. Use the benefits of these offerings to build your church in this place as a witness to the love you have given to the world in the life and teachings, in the sacrifice and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number 202. I want to once again offer thanks in the spirit of MLB opening week that this congregation knows how to hit curveballs. So now nurture the seed of the new that has been planted in your heart. May you be open to what grows from that seed. Go out to serve the Lord and others. Amen.
Thank you, Katie, and thank you, everyone. Please join us for refreshments in the Fellowship Hall.